The Book Review Podcast has been around for almost 14 years, and we would love to hear your feedback. Let us know what you think by joining our panel at nytimes.com slash the book review. Thanks so much. Why is contemporary poetry so political? Our poetry editor, Greg Coles, will be here to talk about the year in poetry. Which books should your kids read this season? Our children's books editor, Maria Russo, will be here to discuss the year's best books for kids. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the literary world. Plus, we'll talk about what we and the wider world are reading. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. I'm Pamela Paul. Joining us now, my colleague Greg Coles, who many of you know from what we're reading. He's our senior editor here, but he is also secretly our poetry editor and so joins us this week in that role. Hi, Greg. Hi, Pamela. This week, you put together an issue entirely about poetry. Entirely about poetry, specifically about political poetry, because that's kind of where all the heat is in poetry at the moment. Poetry feels like it's it's having a real resurgence in the culture at large. And at the center of that resurgence is specifically political poetry. And so I wanted to put together an issue that looked at that. So to be completely transparent here, what happened was I said to Greg, let's have a poetry issue in December. And why don't you come up with the theme or what see what's out there in terms of, of what's being published and suggest some ideas around which this issue might be based. In previous times when we've done an all-poetry issue, one time we focused on new voices in poetry, another time we talked about contemporary poetry, and a third time we talked about sort of the year in poetry. And so how did you come up with this, and did you think about other possibilities, or was this just very much evident as as a kind of pervasive theme in in the poetry world? It's been pervasive and evident over the past several years. And I don't mean to suggest that political poetry did not exist before the past several years. It has always existed. T Magazine recently did a photo shoot and a long essay looking at black male writers. And Ayanna Mathis wrote that essay. And she had a great line in there about a radio station that's kind of always playing, but that the culture only tunes in sometimes. And it feels maybe like that's what's happening with political poetry. And I don't mean just black political poetry, although there's a lot of that as well, poetry that looks at racism and kind of troubled race relations in America. But there's also queer politics and feminist politics and class politics and pacifism. And all of that is in this issue. And what I really wanted this issue to do was be in communication with the long tradition of political poetry and the current moment of political poetry. And so I include reviews of recent collected works by Adrian Rich, who was writing a generation ago, even going all the way back to like Bertolt Brecht, writing in the, the 20s, more famous as a playwright, of course, but he was a prolific poet and his collected poetry that Live Right just brought out is something like a thousand pages long. And and he was writing about communism and very much politics at the heart of his poetry. Robert Bly, who wrote against the Vietnam War. And so you have this kind of long tradition across different kind of political movements of poets, not just engaging in politics, but really being kind of activists mm-hmm. in the culture. It's this notion of poets as the unacknowledged legislators pushing against the dominant culture in a lot of ways and trying to move that culture to be more inclusive, to be more fair. So uh, poetry by nature allows a certain slipperiness, a certain ambiguity and playfulness. It, It becomes a very good place for politically minded people to explore those questions. And for experimentation. Yeah, that, that's right. To, to push against kind of the dominant narrative. It's so this is not just a simple, the election of 2016, here's what happened. That's kind of, right. Of, Some poets have written directly at that. We have a review in here of Terrence Hayes's new book. His new book, which is not a book of poetry, although he had one of those this year, too, called American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. And that book was written directly in response to the 2016 election. 
His new book, in keeping with the the theme of the issue looking back, is kind of a, a hybrid nonfiction look at the black arts poet, Etheridge Knight, a prison poet, and looking at his influence on Terence Hayes' own work. But Terence Hayes is an example of somebody who was writing directly in response to the 2016 election in his most recent poetry collection. The centerpiece of the issue is our cover essay, which is by Tracy K. Smith. Why did you ask Tracy to write an essay for this issue, and what did she choose to write about? Well, a couple of reasons. She is the current United States Poet Laureate, and so she is somebody who thinks a lot about poetry in the culture, its place. And and as the Poet Laureate of the United States, I mean, specifically about kind of an official poetry and a sponsored poetry, but also resisting that notion. Mm -hmm. And also in her own most recent book, Wade in the Water, she balanced questions of the personal and the political in a way that felt very much of the moment, kind of at at the center of what poetry is doing now. So for both of those reasons, I wanted her to look at how poets are doing that right now, what has led it to be kind of at at the center of what poetry is doing, Why, why the audience for this right now. Okay, before we get to how she answered those questions, I just want to take a step back. What is the Poet Laureate? What's the role of the Poet Laureate? Are they supposed to be, is this person an ambassador to American readers? For poetry, are they supposed to be spreading poetry to the readers of the nation? Like, What is that role (laughs) meant to do? Both of those things. It's a little bit of an amorphous position, so it gives the title holder a lot of freedom to do what he or she wants with it. Previous poet laureates have established poetry programs in, in schools. They did the... I believe that it was a poet laureate, Robert Pinsky, who established National Poetry Month in April, and that that has continued as a tradition. What Tracy has done with the position, she's really gone around community to community, especially in kind of underserved schools and and populations, encouraging poetry workshops, kind of bringing examples of poetry and then teaching people um, how to write their own poems and then bringing that back into kind of a a more official, you know, quote, unquote. So she's official. not going to like poetry graduate programs and teaching people who are already aspiring poets, but really going to school children or people who are in prison or other places in the country. For, for the most part, that's exactly right. She's in her second term as poet laureate. Is that um, unusual to be the poet laureate twice in a row? It it is. It's happened before, but it's not the usual course of things. It's not like the president where you know you you kind of anticipate. Oh, now he's the second term. Yeah, it, exactly. Part of what she's just done in her second term as poet laureate is bring out a collection of kind of American poets published by Gray Wolf Press, and it's it's looking at people that she thinks deserve more recognition. Who names the Poet Laureate? The Library of Congress, okay. Librarian of Congress. All right. So yeah. it's not then perhaps as surprising that she would be named <laughs> in this time to be the Poet Laureate. It's She's not necessarily the person you might think would come first to mind if to this administration. Oh no, it 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 is nobody in the in the admin in from the White House. So this ever. is Carla Hayes, the that, librarian right. of Congress. Yes, yes. And what how did Tracy answer those questions that you talked about in her essay? Well, it's interesting. She looked back at her time in graduate school. She came through a, a fairly traditional academic program. She went to Harvard undergraduate, she went to Columbia for her MFA in poetry. She has published with very established, reputable presses. And so she she's very much part of the, the establishment as a poet. And so she takes that experience and looked back at being in the establishment. She was always discouraged from writing political poetry. It wasn't what was applauded in workshops. It wasn't what was taught in literature classes or in creative writing programs. and. Then she looks at how that has changed, especially since 9-11. And as the culture has become very polarized, she's looked at the gradual acceptance within the establishment of poetry that 
directly engages. More overtly political. Yes, it, exactly. Why was poetry, when she was in graduate school, that was political in nature, sort of, was it considered a lesser art or sort of not as pure? Or what was the, what was the judgment there? I'm not sure we know the answer to that. She cites a couple of people. One is Adrian Rich, who is in this issue. Another is Denise Levertov. And there is a, a long tradition, as I said, kind of across different strands of politics of activist poets. But I, I think sometimes it, maybe professors were made uncomfortable that it was too soapboxy or I mean maybe it was just because it was too much of a direct challenge to the status quo I think that's the same thing that people are embracing about it now whenever we have a thematic issue like this as much as you try to be as inclusive even if there is a a theme within the theme as there is in this case in terms of political poetry specifically within poetry there's always that what gets left out and what did we not get to review or to cover in some way. And one of the things that you do have in this issue that's a little bit apart from the rest of the issue is our poetry columnist, David Orr's 10 Best Poetry Collections of 2018. And I'm curious sort of what else stood out this year that may not have been otherwise included in in the issue on his list. David was not tasked with and did not specifically look at political poetry, although there's some of that on his list. But what he did take on himself as as part of the mandate to look at the year's best poetry was specifically looking at under-recognized things. So, for instance, Terence Hayes' book is not on here. It got a very favorable review in the Daily Times by Carl Sagel. Kevin Young is is not on here. It got a very substantial review in the Sunday Book Review. So so books that David felt had already gotten attention by and large are not on his list. Instead, he's looking at things that might have escaped people's notice. A. E. Stallings, who had published a couple of books already with smaller presses, just came out with a substantial collection from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux called Like. She is very much a a formal poet looking back at kind of classical forms. And, you know, her her book was one of the great and under-recognized books this year. There was a book called The Popol Va. I'm not even sure that I'm pronouncing that right. It's a translation of a Mayan creation myth, sort of the origin story that would be lost to culture. But this guy, Michael... Bazet, also not sure I'm pronouncing it right, translated it into contemporary English for Milkweed Press. He does also include at least one major book that we did review this year. That's Wade in the Water by Tracy K. Smith, a book by a poet named Jeffrey Yang called Hey Marfa. So, you know, there there are 10 books on this list, and, and you'll really have to look up his article to see what David Orr has picked as the best poetry of 2018. Greg, why don't you take us through some of the works reviewed in this issue and tell us a little bit about the the poets themselves. Sure. So I mentioned that one of the things I was after in this issue was a conversation between the past and the present. I mentioned Adrian Rich. It makes me very happy that you have a poet like Adrian Rich in this issue who was kind of a trailblazer as a feminist, as a queer poet, looking at these issues of women and their place in the culture, gender, sexuality. She's in this issue, and so is Eileen Miles, M-Y-L-E-S, who is doing very much traveling that same path right now and has been for 30 years and and still is now kind of evolving. The, The name of the book under review is Evolution. That book is reviewed by Natalie Diaz, And at the same time in this issue, we have a debut book called If They Come For Us by a young poet named Fatima Asghar, who is queer and Muslim, orphaned, grew up in America as a teenager right after 9-11. And so, you know, it's it's this very kind of political look at all of those things crossing boundaries. And so you have... Audrey and Rich and Eileen Miles and now Fatima Asghar all kind of tracing this evolution of that specific kind of poetry. Finally, another debut book that was also a finalist for the National Book Award, um, and we reviewed in this issue, 
a book called Museum of the Americas by J. Michael Martinez. It's, again, a hybrid book. It includes photos and, and sort of distilled essays along with more traditional verse poetry. And it looks at the history of colonization in the Americas. So that's just a sampling of, of what's in the issue. That was Greg Coles, our poetry editor, talking about this week's politics and poetry issue. Thanks so much, Greg. Thank you, Pamela. So here's a request for our listeners. I get lots of feedback from you, some complaints, lots of kind words. Really appreciate it. You can always reach me directly at books at nytimes.com. I will write back. But you can also, if you feel moved to do so, review us on any platform where you download the podcast, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or somewhere else. Please feel free to review us and, of course, email us at any time. Joining us now are children's books editor Maria Russo to talk about the year's best books for children. Hi, Maria. Hi, Pamela. So let's start with picture books. We'll talk about picture books, middle grade, and then maybe a teeny bit of YA because they're so much fun. But let's start with books for young children. What were some of your favorite picture books this year for kids? Well, I thought it was a great year for picture books. There's really something for every kind of kid. My favorite overall, I would say, is a book by John Agee, who I know you like too. It's called The Wall in the Middle of the Book. This is a funny picture book that's also kind of weirdly prescient and really good good for the moment that we're in. It's about a little knight who is on one side of the wall, and he's very happy to be on that side of the wall. That And the wall is in the middle of the book, as the title says. On the other side is a big, scary ogre. And so he starts out telling you how happy he is to be on the safe side until suddenly we realize the water is rising on his side and there's all kinds of, you know, aquatic animals that look kind of menacing. And so by the end of the book, you know, he kind of hops over onto the other side and realizes the ogre's not so bad and things are pretty okay on that side of the book. So I just love this book and I think it would be good for any kid ages three to eight, really, if you want to get a picture book and a, a real example of the great art of the picture book. You know, what's what's funny about this book is that when I first read it, I read it more as a kind of metafiction because you have the left hand page as one side of the wall and the right hand is the other and the gutter. You know, what we right. refer to with the gutter in publishing is the is the wall in between. Right. And, and so he puts it's this, bricks up that gutter. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like this this metafiction type of thing that people from Hervé Toulet's press here to there's a monster at the end of this right. book, that old cookie monster book um, with Grover, where you're kind of playing with with the format of the book, but it is interesting that it has it has gained this kind of other layer. Right, of I'm sure he's, resonance. he probably who knows when he started this book, but it does. There's lots of walls and talk about walls in the news right now, and this book is kind of saying you don't necessarily have to be so scared of what's on the other side. Can we talk about John Agee for a minute? Because he is such an amazing talent. He's one of the great. And what's great about him is he really understands the visual language of a picture book. So there's tons of stuff in his books that you find in the pictures and that your kid will find. If you're reading it with a kid, they're going to see things that you might not necessarily notice. So in this book, for example, there's a whole other story going on with what's happening as the water rises. There's all First there's these little fishies, and then there's a big fish that comes and eats those little fishies. And then an even bigger fish comes and eats that medium-sized fish. And none of that's in the words. That's just in the pictures. Okay, what's your favorite John E.G. book? Is this it? This actually is, even though we both love It's Only Stanley, which yes. has a great kind of twist at the end. Milo's Hat Trick is a great one. And... Life on Mars is another one with a that he, he likes to have a big surprise at the end, which I think is great for small children. Life on Mars, to me, has also one of the great surprises in picture books at the end. All right. Let's go to the next one. What I love so much about the books that you chose, Maria, is that many of them are just these. All of the ones you chose are great new talents, but four of them are from great artist illustrators who do both the text and the illustrations and have just started to kind of put out at least one book a year that is just of astounding quality. So what's the next book on your list? Um, Well, one great one is called Fox and Chick, The Party, The Party and Other Stories, actually. It's by Sergio Roussier. And this one is, what I like about this one is that it's a picture book. You can 
completely read it comfortably to a three or a four year old. But it also could work as a first reader for your six or seven year old who's just getting the hang of reading it. It reminds me kind of a frog and toad. Right. Or like Mo Willems, maybe. Like Mo, it's yeah, a little bit like Mo and... Willems. It's a little more of a painterly kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's not quite as graphic as as Mo Willems because Rousier is really a nice kind of fine artist painter in these books. So the fox, it's two friends, which is always such a good combination for these kinds of books. And the fox is kind of laid back and sardonic. And the chick is really just hyper, you know, really constantly doing crazy things. And one of the stories, the party, the title story that the chick wants to have a party in the bathroom and kind of makes this giant mess all over Fox's bathroom. And so there's just that kind of stuff that just skirts on the edge of naughty. Right. I love the way he uses animals to describe these like very mundane, everyday, real human child problems. I think he did one that was, I can't remember the exact title. It was like, have you seen my socks or I've lost my sock about, I think, a duck that has lost a sock, which I think is a scenario that will speak to every parent and child. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And he also recently did a re-illustration of those great Florence Perry Hyde books called Tales for the Perfect Child, Ah. uh, where he does exactly what you're saying. He turns these parables, which you could draw them as people or animals. He chooses to draw them as animals. And so it it kind of helps children to really identify and yet, you know, laugh, too, at the naughty behavior. All right. I see your next book is by Sophie Blackall, who is really like a star of illustration. She's fantastic. She won the Caldecott Medal a few years ago. This book is called Hello Lighthouse. This is really a passion project for her. She's been working on it for years. And it's a tribute to lighthouses, which are, as everyone knows, you know, no longer performing their age-old function of guiding the way for people at night at sea, but are still really a fascinating relic of that time. And she basically did tons of research into lighthouses and how it was to live in a lighthouse. She read Lighthouse Keeper's journals. And then she simplified, in the great tradition of picture books, she simplified all of that into a beautiful picture book for that a, a five-year-old would be perfectly interested in about one lighthouse and the different families that lived in it over the years. And in one scene, one of the, the lighthouse keeper's wife actually gives birth in the lighthouse. It's I always think of that song from A Clockwork Orange, I Want to Marry a Lighthouse Keeper. Ah. <laughs> Probably not for kids. But... Because it was a strange way to live, right? Yes. It's a round, you're living in a round house, right. tiny, with many, many floors in it. Right. Well, definitely a childhood fantasy when you put it that way. All right. The next book is by Jillian Tamaki, who we love at the book review. She's the artist who does the portraits in our By the Book series. Of but course. It's also really an incredible children's book author. She is. She's done graphic novel illustration before, you know, with her cousin, Mariko Tamaki. They com- they collaborated for this one summer. Um, but this is her first full-on picture book, and it's really beautiful. It's called They Say Blue, and it's one of those books that doesn't have so much a story as it kind of moves you through the day and the seasons with one little girl who's noticing things in the world around her and All the things she notices have to do with colors and the way things change over the course of the day or over the course of the seasons. And the title comes from the idea that a lot of kids, the realization a lot of kids have at some point that, well, they say water is blue, but when I hold it in my hands, that's not blue. Right, right. I know I love the way that she plays with the kind of traditional seasons book and tells it instead through color and imagination and observation and just does something a little bit different with that It really idea. feels different. It really feels like a completely unique picture book. And I think one that any, any, any home that, ha- that loves art, it would be nice to keep on your coffee table. All right. You have another book on your list of picture books here, Night Job. This is kind of a a, a sleeper book because it, it seems like a sort of small and quiet book, but I found it extremely powerful and profound. The author is Karen Hess and the illustrator is G. Brian Karras. And it's just the story of a little boy whose dad is a janitor who cleans schools at night. And the little boy goes with him and they ride there on the back of the kid rides on the back of the dad's motorcycle. And... For a little while, he helps his dad with the sweeping, and then he kind of goes to the library and reads, and he falls asleep. And at the end of the night, he gets, they get back on the motorcycle and drive home and look at the beautiful night sky around them and eat a little bit, and they fall asleep together in the dad's chair for a little extra sleep. And it's just so warm and touching and such a great depiction of the reality of a working parent and the closeness that a dad and a son can have physically that you don't often see. 
There's one other book that made your list of notable books, children's books of 2018, that I want to talk about because I love it so much, which is The Rabbit Listened by Corey Dorfeld. Oh, that's an important book. Yeah. I feel like it's <laughs> it's like a picture book version of the parenting book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. Great point. It's true. It's true. It's just it's a, another one of these really simple books. Like it's it's probably geared for ages two to four, you know. Although a, I've I've seen Seen older children appreciate it in my experience and right. grown ups. And, and grown up, that's the thing, even grown ups get what this book is trying to say. So a, a child whose name is Taylor, could be a girl, could be a boy, you could take it either way that works for you, has a block tower that falls over and People walk by with all kinds of advice. You know, you've got to go build that block tile right back up or you should go yell at the person who knocked it over. And that's not helping. Right. And the only thing that helps is a little rabbit who just kind of sits there and listened. And then by the end of the little session where Taylor is telling the whole story and the rabbit is listening, Taylor feels better. Yeah. And the problem is solved just by listening. It works in so many levels because everyone that comes by is an animal and each animal is offering a kind of advice of a certain kind that also plays into the stereotype of of that that animal. animal, And so you have the ostrich who basically is like, why don't you just ignore it? You know, (laughs) and then the elephant that wants to trumpet and another animal only has advice and Everything is, you know, not what what the child needs at that time. And it isn't until the child is essentially able to have a quiet companion who listens with an open mind and without judgment and without advice. And she can or he can vent and explain the whole thing in his or her own way. And and what's amazing, too, is that the child then basically echoes everything that each animal did. The child vents, the child argues, the child, and then ultimately comes to a solution of his or her own at the end. It's just like everything you need to know about empathy and human communication in one right. picture book. And just listening sometimes. Sometimes people just want a, a friendly ear. Okay, so that's Co- Corey Dorfeld, The Rabbit Listened. And to just go quickly through those titles in case people are interested in them, Hello Lighthouse, written and illustrated by Sophie Blackall. Night Job by Karen Hess, illustrated by G. Brian Karras. The Wall in the Middle of the Book, written and illustrated by John Agee. And They Say Blue, written and illustrated by Jillian Tamaki. And let's not forget The Party, Fox and Chick, The Party by Sergio Rousier. All right. Okay, let's go to middle grade. What were some of your favorite middle grade novels this year? Well, I have to say my overall favorite middle grade novel is called Inkling. It's by Kenneth Oppel, and it's illustrated by one of our favorite illustrators, Sydney Smith. What I love about it, this book is that it's a psychological thriller, which I think is really great for middle grade children. Middle grade, of course, is ages 8 to 12 traditionally. I think an older kid w- would even get into this book. It's it's very creepy, mysterious. So there's a boy named Ethan. His dad's a famous artist. But Ethan knows the secret, which is that his dad is actually creatively blocked and hasn't drawn anything in a long time. So one day this ink spot appears to Ethan and sort of promises, I can solve the problem for your dad. Let's work together. And this ink spot kind of shape shifts and becomes bigger and smaller and takes on different forms. And and it's sort of one of those bargain with the devil kind mm-hmm. of things. And Ethan's like, that sounds great. Sure, let's go for it. And of course, things don't turn out quite as planned and in, in fact turn very ominous and scary. But it's just so well written. The art is just the right amount of art. I, I'm one of the people who believes that middle grade readers need art in their books. I don't like giant chunks of text only, especially for the eight to 10 year olds. I think some nice art in the pages really helps. And especially as in this book where the art is actually really integral to the story, you actually see the ink spot all over the pages. It's fantastic. All right. Well, speaking of art, the next two middle grade books you have are both deeply illustrated. They're both right. graphic in novels. In fact, they're graphic novels. So I'm, I'm showing my hand here. <laughs> The first one is called Be Prepared. It's by Vera Brosgall. This is one of those middle grade novels that also, I think, skews on the older side. So you have the, you know, the great Raina Telgemeier's graphic novels that really are, I think, on the younger side of the 8 to 12. This one, I think, you know, 10 and up. It's a girl who is a Russian immigrant living in upstate New York, and she's not quite fitting in with the popular girls at school. She doesn't quite understand how to all of the, they all have the fancy dolls, the American girl dolls, clearly that she does a great parody of, you know, their her, her mom serves weird Russian food. They don't do the right birthday traditions. So she decides that going to summer camp would be just the way to become more American. And her mom says, well, okay, I'm going to send you to a Russian summer camp. So mm-hmm. she goes to a sort of 
all Russian summer camp that turns out to be sort of a harrowing experience, but also really funny, really funny and insightful about all the ways that kids don't feel they fit in. It can be, you know, at the Russian summer camp, she's not Russian enough. <laughs> right. You know? I was a huge fan of Broskel's debut graphic novel, which was YA. So for kids older yet, probably 14 or 15 and up called Anya's Ghost, which came out, I think, about six or seven years ago. Mm-hmm. And in that that novel, it's once again the sort of Russian misfit girl, although this time in high school, being befriended by a ghost who may not be entirely a friend and similar kinds of things. And what's interesting, too, when you think about it, is that there have been so many novels by Russian emigres to America, Boris Fishman, Gary Steingart, but not a lot by women. So this is kind of That's a good point. There's there's actually another great graphic novel by Dasha Tolstikova, is that her name, uh, called a Year Without Mom, mm-hmm. which is another, another great one. So, yeah, it is good to see the girl perspective on this experience that as when you read grown-up literary fiction, you see lots of the male point of view. All right, you've got one more graphic novel for kids. Well, this is a book that is not on the Notable Children's Books list, but as I looked back over the list, I thought I wish I had found a place for it because the kids in my life and a lot of our colleagues' kids, in fact, are crazy for this book. It's a new graphic novel series called Mr. Wolf's Class, by Aaron Nell Steinke. And this book, I would say, is on the aimed a little bit on the younger side. The class is fourth grade. So we all know most kids like to read about kids a little bit older than them. What's great about this book is, again, it's animals. Every kid in the class is a different kind of animal, but they, they walk upright and they dress like kids. And they do have some of the behaviors of their animals. So there's, you know, cats and a rabbit. There's a duck. There's pigs. And, of course, the teacher, Mr. Wolf, who is... A wolf. But the the twist here is that Mr. Wolf is really nice. And in fact, he's kind of too nice. And that some of the, the funny situations in the class are because Mr. Wolf has a hard time kind of being wolf-like <laughs> with these really sort of rowdy children. Maria has revealed a secret about how the book review really operates in her comment which is that many of our current staff have kids that are right now in the children's book, you know, the children's book reading age. And so we have like a great internal focus group. It's true. We pass these books around. And I will say that Mr. Wolf's class was all the books I mentioned today. In fact, big hits with 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 our little test crew. All right, let's just talk about YA for a few minutes. These are books that are labeled young adult, but as we all know, and increasingly so, are being read by grown-ups of all ages, especially young adults, meaning real young adults, kid people in their 20s, but also, you know, people right, considerably that's... older. We won't get into exact <laughs> age ranges. Tell us about some of your favorite YA books. Well, of course, we have on our list the National Book Award winner for Young People's Literature, The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. This is a fantastic book. It's written in verse, which you don't really see in books for adults, but actually is thriving in books for teenagers. Might seem surprising to some people. Teenagers like to read books in verse. For one thing, they kind of go faster. (laughs) You know, there's like more that's just sort of gestured at. It doesn't have so much long explanation. It's about a girl, a Dominican-American girl who is living in Washington Heights and finding her voice as a slam poet. So she begins the book kind of battling a lot of inner doubts and dealing with her sort of strict Catholic family and not finding a place that she feels she fits in at school. And it's through slam poetry that she sort of finds her voice and is able to break out a little bit. But it's really, a, the word I would use is electrifying when mm-hmm. she finds that voice. And you can see some of her how her poetry just kind of jumps out of the page. All right. Another one you wanted to talk about? Um, And then I would say if you're looking for a fantasy, a YA fantasy, the book of the year is Children of Blood and Bone by Tommy Adeyemi. This is 500 pages. And again, the pages kind of fly by. It's very cinematic. In fact, I think there's a movie in the work. It's a fantasy. It's kind of a a post-Harry Potter fantasy that takes from African mythology, Nigerian specifically, where Tommy Adeyemi has roots. It's a society, an oppressive society based on color. And of course, the darker skinned heroine is going to battle the forces of injustice. The twist is one of the ways that the oppression works in this society is that they have taken away magic, the traditional magic of her people. And her. so her quest is to overcome this oppressive regime by bringing magic back And she brings magic back. There's going to be, I think, two more. It'll be a trilogy. 
And everyone has been really excited about this book. And as I said, it's 500 pages, but reads really fast. And it's a debut. And it's a debut. She's yeah, I think she's she's young, too. She's only in her 20s, like Elizabeth Acevedo, both really sort of shining new voices on the scene. Well, regular listeners of the podcast know that I'm a fan of another book that made your YA list, which is Melissa Albert's The Hazelwood, also a very dark fantasy, also about magic and storytelling. This is one I talked about a few weeks ago in which a teenager enters her grandmother's sort of uh, dark fantasy or fairy tale universe. The grandmother is the author of this kind of cult and suddenly disappeared collection of dark fairy tales. You know, I love this book, too. What I like about it is... It's one of those books that starts out seeming like it's going to take place in the world as we know it. Mm -hmm. And only gradually do you realize that there's, you know, magic and supernatural stuff going on. And that's always my favorite kind of fantasy. One of the things I thought was interesting about this book, it's published by Flatiron Books, which is an adult publisher. I don't know that they've done YA before, if this is their first or maybe one of their first books for kids. One of their first. But it, it was interesting in that it didn't obey certain kind of rules for writing for children. You have a heroine who smokes. You have sort of certain things, you know, and it, it's never really penalized. You have just certain things that... YA authors even kind of try to avoid, but some people are bending the rules. Lee Bardugo right. bends the rules a little bit about I mean, like I what... I would say, what is YA, right? There's no consensus, but one thing you could think about is when the character is looking back on being a teenager or there's a sense that the book is written with this backwards-looking view right, of a little teenagerhood, bit of then it's an adult book. Right. But if you're right there with the teenager in the teenager's point of view... It's a YA book, and that's the case in this book, even if they're smoking and swearing and doing other, you know, taboo things. Well, another book on your list that I also loved, which I think bends a little bit, blurs the lines, is certainly a crossover YA, was Penelope Bajou's Brazen, Rebel Ladies Who Rock the World. Was right. that published as a grown-up book in France? It was actually France? published as an adult book in France, and I think there were a few changes involving cigarettes oh, really? <laughs> to the American edition. I think some of the cigarettes were were either debated or, or, or disappeared. outright disappeared in the American edition. But this is a fantastic little collection of biographies right now. That's a really big trend for kids and teenagers, just collections of inspiring biographies, usually of women, women that are, have been overlooked, kind of like the Times' is Overlooked obituary series, really popular right now. These are graphic. They're like little mini graphic novels. And she picks people who are just big rule breakers. So the big smoker is Tovey Jansen, you know, the author of Moomins. Right. You know, and she just spends the entire little biography with a cigarette in her hand. And she actually had a very kind of a rule-breaking, risque life. She had, she was gay and she smoked lots and she didn't really fit into, she didn't, wasn't interested in, in fitting in. And then there's lots of political rebels actresses. There's a bearded lady who was perfectly happy being a bearded lady. So it's a it's a fun book. And it's it really could be for an adult too. But I think teenagers, I guess, are always looking to be inspired. And so it works as a YA book. All right. Well, we've covered every age then from three to, to I don't know, uh, 103. <laughs> Maria, thank you so much for being Thanks. here. Thanks. Alexandra Alter joins us now with some news from the publishing world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. Tell us what's new. So this week, my colleague John Koblen and I were looking at what's going on with author appearances on television. This is something that, you know, is always changing as the media landscape changes, but it's been really difficult, particularly for fiction writers in the last few years with all the focus going on to politics. And it's even been hard for writers of serious nonfiction who are addressing subjects that aren't about politics. So we decided to sort of crunch the numbers a little bit and look at where the opportunities were, where it was shrinking. And what was interesting was as we reached out to some TV hosts and programs, we saw a pattern where Seth Meyers and Trevor Noah have kind of emerged as these sort of saviors if, in a way. On late night, after Jon Stewart ended his show and Stephen Colbert ended his Colbert Report, they have kind of filled the gap a little bit, at least in terms of literary fiction. They're both really enthusiastic readers and they're looking for kind of lesser known writers who haven't had a ton of exposure. So that's been very interesting. I think publishers feel like they haven't completely made up for all the losses, particularly post Oprah, post Colbert, post Jon Stewart. But they are seeing that they can get a real boost for kind of underrepresented writers if they do make one of these spots. 
TV is still like the biggest mover, right? Exactly. I mean, maybe some NPR shows can, yeah, can do. Fresh air can absolutely knock you out of the park, but that's about it. But the kind of writers that are getting on are so different because it's not the big name novelists. It's not necessarily Stephen King or John Grisham or sort of the names that everyone knows that these new late night show hosts are selecting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they will have on, you know, Bill Clinton and James Patterson when they put out who? a novel because who wouldn't? Everybody had them on. But I think they're looking more for people who are writing a debut novel or a second novel, authors from diverse communities. So, you know, looking at the guest list in recent years for Seth Meyers was fascinating because he's also, I mean, he's a very enthusiastic reader. He reads the books, apparently. I We interviewed him and and his producer. And sometimes he'll just read something on vacation and love it so much he'll invite the author on. So a lot of the authors he's had on have gone on to win major awards, not necessarily that that is connected, but that he has kind of an eye for groundbreaking fiction. So he's had on authors like Marlon James and Sunil Yapa and Tyree Jones and Jasmine Ward and Viet Ten Nguyen. And meanwhile, you have Trevor Noah, who, you know, still does have on a lot of politicians and celebrities and the like, but he's also made room for writers like Therese Marie Mellot, who wrote a really incredible memoir. The poet Kevin Young went on and Yad Jesse, the debut novelist who's novel Homegoing, I think, made a huge impact. It traces the impact of slavery across 300 years. And, you know, her publicist said that going on that show really got a ton of attention for the book and they saw a huge sales spike afterwards. And that's what a lot of publicists and publishers say. What about the breakfast shows, the Good Morning America and CBS This Morning and the Today Show? Those used to be sort of part of every major book tour, you would get booked for one or the other. And occasionally you might get more than one of them. And and back in, you know, as recently as 15 years ago, you might have four or five minutes to talk about your book with one of the hosts. That's really interesting. I mean, I think they haven't shifted entirely away from books. They will always have on an author, uh, you know, somebody like John Grisham, for example, and they do these kind of roundups of summer fiction or holiday book gift guide, that kind of thing. But as far as in-depth author interviews, it does seem that they've really shifted towards kind of celebrity memoirs and diet books and lifestyle books. And if you go back a while, they used to have authors like E.L. Doctorow and William Styron on. So I think there is not as much literary fiction being represented on the morning shows. It's so different in other countries where in France, for example, you have authors on primetime all the time for major long interviews. And it just... I don't know if that ever existed in the U.S. Yeah, that's, I, that's a fascinating question. I mean, I think, you know, you did have Charlie Rose and, you know, people like that who would do long, in-depth interviews. You still have it on C-SPAN. It's a small audience, but they've even been doing fiction this year. I think the thing that concerned publishers after Oprah stopped having her daily talk show with her book club and then you saw Jon Stewart leaving and then Stephen Colbert ending The Colbert Report— there was the sense that books were at risk of being kind of edged out of popular culture. It's not only the fact that you can launch a single book, you know, onto the bestseller list with one of these appearances. It's the overall perception that, like, why are books not being represented when you have Broadway stars on these talk shows and filmmakers and TV writers and every other kind of art form is is there. I think that's one reason everyone's so relieved that Trevor Noah and Seth Meyers are taking this on and making it really pretty central to their mission. One author that I spoke to who went on Seth Meyers, Rebecca Bakai, said the real impact of going on the show, she she heard from readers who bought her book after they saw her on there. She got some film deal offers and TV offers, but really she felt like it was putting books back in the center of popular culture where they hadn't been represented for a while. You interviewed Trevor Noah for your story. What did he say? Why is he doing this? He was very interesting. You know, he said he inherited this as part of his mission from Jon Stewart, and he absolutely set out to maintain that because Jon Stewart was absolutely beloved in the publishing industry for his commitment to having authors on. But he did say he wanted to approach it differently and was really looking to bring on more diverse writers from different backgrounds and, you know, writers that might not be well known and issues that might not be as central to the current political conversation. So, you know, he's not having as many sort of wonky policy-driven books on as John Stewart used to have. He's got memoirists on. He's got poets, people who are writing about current issues in terms of, you know, race relations and injustice and police violence, but perhaps from a personal perspective. And so they're they're not necessarily, you know, the people who are writing op-eds in major publications. These are sort of 
younger and lesser known writers often. And poets. Very exciting. Yes. Uh Kevin Young was on and he got a huge sales boost from the appearance. All right. Alexandra, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Joining us now to talk about what we're reading, my colleagues Gal Beckerman, Concepcion de Leon, and John Williams. Hey, guys. Hey, Paul. Hey. Hi. Let's start with you, Gal. What are you reading? <laughs> I'm reading uh, Those Who Knew, which is a, a novel by Idra Novi. It's actually her second book. Her earlier book was called Ways to Disappear. And I guess you could call this a political thriller, though it's not a thriller in the sense where you're trying to figure out who did something. It's more that there is a an incredibly violent character at the center of it, and it's kind of the reverberations of, of, of his violence that you're feeling in the book. It also is a bit, kind of has an allegorical feel to it. Let me back up a bit. It's about, it's it takes place on an unnamed island that's clearly south of the United States, and it's 10 years after there's been a political upheaval and a, an a authoritarian regime has been overthrown. And at the center of it is a, is a young senator, a uh, man named Victor, who is one of the kind of bright lights that came after the revolution. But it turns out that he has this kind of dark history, uh, mostly of assaulting women. And there's a woman at the center of the book who was his lover and has kind of figured out that he is this evil character and she wants to find a way to 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 expose him. And so the book is her kind of, the entire book is her over a period of years kind of wrestling with, with how she feels about the, the, this guy's both his power and the implications of his violence on the bodies of women. And it it is it does feel allegorical in the sense that like you don't it's not a specific place that we're talking about, but there's clearly resonances to kind of an interplay between the United States kind of features in it, but not in a named way. September eleventh features in it, but not in a named way. But it's it's one of these books that really has a strong kind of this the tone of it. Uh, it feels like you're reading a, a, a fairy tale or something. Is there an element yeah. of mystery to it? There is. There's a woman in the beginning. The book starts off with a woman who's been killed, a, a young activist. And the our protagonist, Lena, believes that this victor, this young senator, killed her, but she can't mm-hmm. prove it. And we never find out one way or the other. But it, that's that becomes the kind of motif throughout, throughout the book. Is this her second novel? It is, yeah. Her earlier one was called Ways to Disappear. She's and it's interesting. She's a, a translator mostly. Before this, was a trans before she started writing novels. A translator from from Portuguese has done a lot of Brazilian writers. Concepcion, what are you reading? I am reading a book that has been on my list for a while, Kindred by Octavia Butler, and I'm really enjoying it so far. I'm only about a hundred pages in, but the premise of the book is that there's a woman named Dana who is a modern day black woman. Well, modern at the time that the book was written, which is I. Think, think in the 1970s, which is the date that's like referenced in the book as when Dana exists in the present time. And essentially Dana, like I said, a modern day black woman who one day sort of gets transported back to the antebellum South. And it's a terrifying premise. And it actually reminds me a lot of Get Out in that like the terror. The movie. Yeah, the movie. Yes. Get Out the movie. And that the terror of everything, essentially, like, is very rooted in being a black person, essentially, in a space that's hostile to black people. Mm -hmm. And so she goes back in time, and it's sort of like, I feel like I was on edge from the very beginning of reading the book, because I'm like, what's going to happen next? Because literally everything is terrible. And it's funny because it reminds me, there's this kind of joke that resurfaces on Twitter, like, every so often, and it's just like, you know— when you ask the question of like, when would you want to go? Like, right. what year would you want to go back in time to? And black people are always just like, uh, never. <laughs> like, I'll stay right Let's here. Go you know, right? Let's go forward. Right. Let's go forward. And cross um, our fingers. Yeah. And so this book kind of plays into that premise. And there's actually a moment in the book where she's talking to her husband just about, you know, her time travel. And he sort of talks about how maybe it would have been better if she had been able to go to another time. And she's kind of just like, repeats this this joke that it's not it wouldn't have been better you know so the joke was there before twitter yeah exactly so i (laughs) think i found the um source of this joke. what's what's the (laughs) what's the mechanism of the time travel like how does she it's it hasn't been revealed yet um so i don't know i'm sure it will be later but i don't want to give too much away you know it's so i started reading this book and i actually didn't even read the book jacket i don't like reading book jackets i think they give too much away Mm -hmm. so i yeah, I don't want to really get into that because I think that that it'll be a spoiler. <laughs> it's a very, very untime travel cover. 
You have it in front yes. of you. It's this sort of very domestic, quiet cover. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't look I like th- a sci-fi. It doesn't look like science fiction yeah. at all. I thought it was going to be more supernatural, like ghosts mm. kind mm-hmm. of thing. I, th- I think I was thinking about Beloved. <laughs> you have some time to go. There might be ghosts coming up. You never know. <laughs> Did you there was it? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not done with it. You're right. You're right. There's Anything this can happen. Conception it reminds me of a story that I was reading called Vintage Season in that collection of science fiction novellas I'd been talking about on earlier podcasts, which is by actually – Possibly the one woman in that entire collection, Catherine L. Moore and Henry Kuttner, but they published together under the pseudonym Lawrence O'Donnell, had this premise where a man owns a house and someone, a group of people decide to lease it from him, to rent it from him at the same time or some shortly thereafter he gets an offer to buy it and they both wanted this last week in May. And for me, it was so incredibly mysterious why these People all want this house at this one moment, and then the people show up, and they have these very strange customs and manners. And I, who am a total science fiction novice, I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. Like, why? Who are they? And my husband, who knows science fiction, was like, time travelers. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) That is what it ends up being. I'm probably the only reader that didn't get it right away. John, what are you reading? My book is very rooted in the now. It's a new book by the poet Christian Wyman who, these are not poems, although he's written several collections of poems. This is a memoir slash book of criticism slash literature itself called He Held Radical Light. And Wyman, the other book of his I've read other than some poems here and there in in the various collections, is a very intense memoir called My Bright Abyss, which was about his relationship to sort of the possibility of his impending death when he was diagnosed with this rare form of cancer when he was still, you know, very young. This book gets a little bit into that, but it's really about the time he spent as the editor of Poetry Magazine for, I think, 10 years in Chicago, his run-ins with several poets who he admired and worked with through that job, people like Mary Oliver, C.K. Williams, Seamus Haney, and some kind of funny little mini portraits of them throughout. And then this very intense kind of critical view of poetry with several poems peppered throughout of his favorites by other people where he shows you the poem and then he writes about it philip larkin and a.r ammons and other people he's he's a really great critic he's very aphoristic he's very very intense and not he's humorless but i don't mean that as an insult he's just a very earnest writer and thinker and this is also about the he's he's christian and he teaches a theology in addition to poetry and so it's also about whether or not art can reflect a kind of higher spiritual dimension and and bridge that gap between the everyday life and higher things that we aspire to. Uh, it's slender. It's only a little more than 100 pages, but it contains a lot. And he's, he's someone who I underline a lot, which is one of my big, <laughs> big standards for any book. Pamela, what about you? You have post-it notes, not underlines. Oh, I do. Yes, post-it notes, because there were so many fun parts of this book. I recently finished reading Crowded Hours by Alice Roosevelt Longworth. She's known for primarily for two things. One, as being the firstborn child of Teddy Roosevelt and his only child by his first wife, who died shortly after giving birth to Alice. She liked to be called Mrs. L. She was known for her many witticisms. The most notable one is probably if you don't have some, I'm going to mangle it slightly, but if you don't have something nice to say about someone, (laughs) sit next to me. Um, So she was a, a major figure of her time. And this memoir was published in 1931 during the Depression when she, like many others, lost her fortune and she wrote it basically to make money and it did make money. It was a, it was a bestseller. And it's about her early years sort of growing up Roosevelt playing um, in the White House and bike riding on the second floor of the West Wing as they did at that time. And sort of very old, different version of Washington, D.C. It feels altogether more pleasant um, than perhaps Washington, D.C. today. And then... Her marriage and her travels, and it really only takes her up to 1930, basically, even though she went on to live until 1980. So there's a lot wow. there's a lot unsaid in here. And I'm interested always in the idea of memoirs versus biography and what gets left out. So what you don't learn in here is that, you know, she her marriage was an unhappy one and that she cheated pretty voraciously on her <laughs> her husband. So there's a lot that's not in here. And I only realized after reading it that it kind of fits into a pattern of of reading for me over the last year, which is reading about women sort of around the turn of the century. The the three memoirs and biographies that I've read have all been about 
women who were near or at the centers of power and who wielded power in ways that were new for women at that time. So I had read earlier this year A Backward Glance by Edith Wharton, and she, of course, was an incredible, powerful literary figure. And then Claire Booth Luce, a biography of her, Rage to Fame, which she was also quite powerful, a, a diplomat and a senator eventually, and the author of the play The Women and the first women manager of a Vanity Fair, managing editor of Vanity Fair. Did those books lead you to this one in particular? Because I know you're also like a big Roosevelt person in general, like the whole clan. So I'm wondering yes. which, which was the thread yes. that got you there. <laughs> I have a child named Teddy and a daughter <laughs> with the name Eleanor. So I've always wanted to read this and I've been given this as a gift by my husband about 15 years ago. Mm. And I think he was like, finally, you know, <laughs> you know, when someone gives you a book and you don't read it right away and you know that they're incredibly annoyed and that it's sort of like a quiet grudge. And he had gotten me this and this other book, Conversations with Mrs. L, which are these long conversations that she had with someone much later in life. So mm. I will probably read that sometime soon. But I think I mostly turned to this. I was in the middle of the science fiction book that I was reading and I'd taken a couple of breaks into YA novels for one reason or another. And I think, I, you know, it's part of my ongoing effort to escape the here and now in any form possible. And so I'll, I'll read you just one little excerpt from it. It'll give you a sense of her personality. And also, you know, this is very, very dated. But she took an incredible trip to the Far East when she was, I think, in her early 20s. And she was traveling with uh, a group of people. Among them was this person, uh, Nick Longworth, who eventually became her husband. And so this is an excerpt from when she is in China. After the presentations were over, the ladies of the party were taken to lunch with the Empress of the East and the Empress of the West, the two principal wives of the emperor, and a most delightful old Chinese princess. There was no interpreter, but our hostesses and their ladies kept up a continuous chatter, we talking busily in English with one another and at them. After lunch, when we wandered about the gardens, the Empress Dowager joined us. She gave us all presents, heavy gold bracelets and rings that were carried about by an attendant, who followed her around and handed us each our particular gifts. The old Buddha talked to all of us, in turn, through an interpreter. Her conversation with me was the usual perfunctory formalities of such an occasion— the high esteem in which China held the United States, inquiries as to the health of my father, the hope that I was enjoying my visit. The interpreter was Wu Ting Fang, who had been minister in Washington. He stood between us, a little to the side, but suddenly, as the conversation was going on, the empress said something in a small, savage voice, whereat he turned quite gray and got down on all fours, his forehead touching the ground. The empress would speak, he would lift his head, and say it in English to me, Back would go his forehead to the ground while I spoke. Up would come his head again while he said it in Chinese to the empress. Then back to the ground would go his forehead again. There was no clue to her reason for humiliating him before us. When I told father about it, father, of course, being Theodore Roosevelt, then president, he thought it might have been to show us that this man whom we accepted as an equal was to her no more than something to put her foot on that it was a way of indicating that none of us either amounted to much more than that, in her opinion. It was a curious experience to see the same man who enjoyed making blandly insolent remarks at dinner parties in Washington and invidious comments on America in press interviews, kowtowing at one's feet. One literally had the feeling that she might at any moment say, off with his head, and that off the head would go. <laughs> so it's... Wow. It's your own sort of time thing. travel. It is, it is, it is, I think... Concepcion and I are both time traveling <laughs> yeah. to very different and not altogether necessarily better places. <laughs> so anyway, Gal, Concepcion, John, thanks so much. Thanks, Thank Pamela. you for having us. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back, albeit not right away. The Book Review Podcast is produced by Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media with the great help of my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Mm-hmm.